and happy Valentine's to you in Wehem. Good morning. It is Friday, February 14th, and we have a great show here for you. The news headlines, the weather report, and today in history. This morning, Ask the Selectman, Alan Slavin, joins us to weigh in on the debate over naming the new elementary school Wehem rebranding campaign, and should the Selectman worry about political correctness. Also this morning, a young filmmaker from Fairhaven combines talent with an actress from Wareham to expose the opioids addiction disease. The young actor says she wants to destigmatize the issue through humanizing the victims. But first, I would like to take this moment to thank Not Your Average Antiques, an antique shop down Cranberry Highway in East Wareham for donating the props that you see in the morning show. Stay with us. The news headlines are next. <music> the first year student at Bridgewater State University is this year's lucky recipient of Wayham Historical Society Scholarship Award. Mikina Fitzgerald. A graduate of Wareham High School said that the money will help her with the student bills as she pursues elementary school education. The Wareham Historical Society awards scholarships annually to Wareham High School graduates who are going or are already uh, pursuing higher education. It is not clear how much Ms. Fitzgerald received this year. And a biological... A bio a biology teacher at Wayham High School faces the challenge to keep his bees alive as temperatures drop. Sean Brown received a grant from the Make Peace Foundation four years ago for beekeeping. The bees were part, were part of a plan to create two cranberry bogs for educational purposes at the Wayham Middle School. Brown hopes that the bees would help pollinate the cranberry bogs as well as serving as a learning resource at the high school. Brown explains um, that he thinks the students actually enjoy the program, despite being worried about getting stung. <laughs> and an investment opportunity and a cold glass of beer is what one potential brewer has installed for this town. The Lucky Goat Bruin is seeking funding through a site called Main Vest, uh, Main Vest which, also, which allows individuals to invest in the brewery with a set return on their investment. The company has been making strides in both licensing and construction. The Bruin is set to open on Main Street at the Old Fish Market. For more information about Lucky Goat Brewing or to make an investment, you can visit mainvest.com slash business slash Lucky Goat Brewing. There's plenty of time for you to get in the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. And three property owners in Wareham may face, a, may face a battle in court if they fail to comply with the Wareham Code regulations, on Tuesday night, the Board of Selectmen voted yes for the Wareham Code Task Force, a group uh, that is composed of representatives of both the fire district and the police department, along with the health agent and the director of inspectional services, to bring three problem properties to court as a last resort. The Wareham Code Task Force is looking to bring Donald McMullin, the owner of 16 Wareham Avenue, and Richard White, the owner of 2838 Cranberry Highway, in addition to Carl Cornwell, the owner of 193 Main Street. According to the group, both owners have failed to respond to the team's visits, calls, and letters on the numerous complaints regarding their properties. The task force has successfully brought a number of other properties into compliance without bringing them to court. 
And that ends this morning news folk, uh, news headlines. Uh, stay with us as weather forecast is next. Well, it is sunny out there, barely. Clouds are going to take over. It is cold. My note says it's much colder, but Jita, it's winter. It is cold. High at 33 degrees. Winds at 10 to 20 miles per hour. Tonight, low at 7 degrees, single digit. Oh, my goodness. Tomorrow, intervals of clouds and sunshine. High at 27 degrees. Winds at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Cloudy at night with lower 23 degrees. Sunday, mostly cloudy skies, high at 43. So we are going to get up there eventually. We're looking at 10 to 20 miles per hour on winds. Possible showers uh, at night on Sunday night with low around 27 degrees. So either way, it is for Aiden. Anyhow, that's this weekend uh, weather forecast. We are going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to continue with our program. Well, Wareham Week newspaper recently turned 10 years old on January 21st this year. To learn more about the newspaper, I visited uh, the Wareham Week headquarters on Main Street and I sat down with the founder and publisher to talk more about their journey. So take a look. I wouldn't have started it if I wasn't reasonably optimistic that it would be a good business idea, but looked at from the outside, you know, starting a newspaper in January in yeah. the middle of the Great Recession would not be a strategic planner's dream. Going into that, I mean, I'm, and, and a community that, you know, is, for all its super positive things, is economically challenged. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure I would have picked Wareham. But I knew Wareham. I'd lived there for more than 30 years. Um, raised a family here. Mm. And for that reason, I, I picked Wareham. So tell me about your first year. It was a wild ride. Yeah. And we launched into a, a fairly politically charged environment. I think part of it was driven by the Wareham Observer. And you know, I, I think there are some of our you know, early supporters who felt like we were launched as an anecdote to the Wareham Observer, um, which definitely had a point of view. Mm. And we didn't have the opposite point of view, but we had no point of view, which mm -hmm. was different. Um, but that wasn't really the reason. But there was a lot of political maneuvering in town that was that was tough for two brand new journalists right out of of school. Mm -hmm. um, first editor Cyrus Moulton right out of Columbia Journalism School, and first editor Jamie Revhan, who people in Wareham may know as Jamie Revhan Buckminster now. Yeah. Um, and we were all sort of figuring out what we were doing as a business, and you know, being accused at the same time of other things of being the political tool of the cranberry industry. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> you know, we, we rent this office space from, you know, the Dicas Real Estate Trust, and, you know, the cranberry industry wasn't sending me money. I was sending <laughs> Dicas money. 
Um, but, you know, it, but it was fun. I mean, it, it, creating something new is always, it, you know, a charge. How is it, uh, what's the experience like covering this town? You talked about you, when you came in, it was a very politically charged environment. A lot of distrust. That is still an issue that I'm facing in this industry. Getting interviews with, with department heads, there is still that mistrust with the media. So what is your experience covering this town and getting what you need out of this town? Well, let me back up a minute. Okay. I mean, since we launched Wareham Week, after about a year and a half, mm. we felt like we had, had proved the model that what we were doing in Wareham was working as local media and that it was ready to be replicated elsewhere. And we started Sipican Week mm. with the same model covering Mary Poison in Rochester. And then several years later started Dartmouth Week covering the town of Dartmouth. It's always a challenge for a reporter anywhere mm -hmm. to get information. And, you know, I think at base it, it's a lot about ability to develop relationships. And as you said, you know, the trust. Just getting, you know, being able to, to talk openly to people. That's a, that's a real challenge that I think every young journalist faces of, you know, developing the trust with sources. Um, while still running the business, selling ads that, you know, make sure that everyone's paycheck clear every week. Yeah. What was your motto? You talked about the motto when you, be you began and you said it proved success. So it's like you, you replicated it in other towns. What, when you were starting this business, what was the motto? And um, is it... Now, 10th anniversary, <laughs> you know, are you staying true to your initial idea, initial concept of the role you wanted to play in this town? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think every so often in trying to clean up my computer files, I stumbled across the, the PowerPoint presentation that I had with the, you know, the, the business model when I was looking for financing for it. Mm. And it's pretty darn accurate. I, mean, the, I think the key points, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. were a product both online and in print that's, that's of modern design. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about being tight, bright, and right mm -hmm. for, you know, shorter stories. There's, I think being obsessively local, as I call it. I think that in the industry they call it hyper-local, but, mm -hmm. you know, obsessively local captures the idea with it. We are just about Wareham. Um, we are not about things that interest people in Wareham, which unfortunately I tell organizations out of New Bedford all the time that, you know, yes, I know people from all, you know, five of the towns we serve, yeah. will, you know, go to your theater productions or, you know, look at your galleries. But we, if we started expanding our, you know, our coverage umbrella to things that interested people in Wareham, we would be covering the Red Sox. And guess what? We're not. Yeah. Um, you know, I think keeping the really tight local focus, and that's something I get a lot of feedback that's positive. It allows us to, to do a product that, you know, something on every page is, is relevant to everyone in Wareham. Um, and free. What do you say to the argument that print journalism is dead? It isn't here. The newspaper itself was an overnight success. Within three months we were the, the newspaper of record for, for Wareham and I've never looked back. I mean we still, more copies of Wareham Week are picked up every week than there are households in the town of Wareham. Mm -hmm. Now does this mean that everybody reads Wareham Week? Pretty darn close. You know obviously not, obviously because some you know, copies at Shaw's are probably picked up by people who live in Rochester for instance. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know I don't See, I don't see print going away in any of the communities we serve, but I think we have a model that if people should gravitate to wanting all their news online and wanting to read us online as in paper, I think we'll, we have a model that will still be economically sustainable. Mm -hmm. So this is last year, towards the end of last year, 
you made an executive decision to omit online comments. Oh boy. <laughs> um, so let's talk about that. Um, do you ever worry that you are censoring speech? No, no, no. And people, I, we still welcome letters to the editor mm -hmm. that appear online and in print and we want people to express their opinions. I loved the comments when we started. There were probably hundreds of people from across the, the political spectrum, mm -hmm. you know, the Wareham political spectrum. I'm not talking Democrats and Republicans. For whatever reason, I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. I'm the, the, con the source for that conversation slowly migrated elsewhere to other you know, social media platforms and the comments had sort of dwindled to, you know, typical of the maybe half dozen, dozen commenters, active commenters that we had left at the time when we shut them off um, was, you know, Joe called Jack a moron or, you know, look at that lady in the mug shot. Does she have birds nesting in her hair? And, you know, not my job to referee a food fight. Yeah. And that's what it had dwindled to, which which is sad. I mean, I wish we could have the, the robust forum back, but I, I, I don't think I know how I could get that back. What's next for you? What does 2020 bring? Well, <laughs> good question. We, we will see. Um, I think some of the kinds of things that, that I'm looking at, at doing is that I would love to, with the staff, work on taking maybe a little bit of more of their time, this is the time management thing again, yeah. to work on larger projects um, on issues that affect where I am. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to sit down with me to share about your 10 years in business here in Wareham. I definitely depend on the paper every single day to do what I need to do. The website every single day. The website, uh, yeah, the website. So uh, I am very grateful and uh, I'm sure many feel the same way and we wish you all the best. Well, I cannot wait to sit down with you to talk about your 20th anniversary. 20th anniversary. <laughs> It'll be there. It'll be there. I have confidence. Oh, yes. So, you know, what we will look like in, in, in 2030, I have no idea. Whether I will still be at the helm, I have no idea. I, I have confidence it will be there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, welcome back. So now we're going to take a look at my interview that I did with uh, Alyssa Botello. She works at Fairhaven Television. She just produced a film by the name of Junkie. And one of the actors in the film was, is a resident here in Wareham. The film is supposed to destigmatize the issue, the disease, the opioids addiction disease. Um, and hopefully through humanizing the victims, the message will get across. So take a look. A real life encounter between a suspect and a police officer inspired a young filmmaker to act, producing a film by the name of Junkie which is meant to expose a heavy subject on addiction and the goal is also to humanize an often stigmatized issue. In the studio, I'm joined with Alyssa Botello, a junior studying film and business at the University of Rhode Island and she's also the filmmaker, the creator of the film Junkie. In addition, she also works here at Fairhaven Television, where our interview is taking place. So join us and more information coming your way. So what a wonderful film. I actually got to see it today, this morning, to prepare for our interview today.
Um, so let's talk about uh, the idea behind the film. I know that it is based on a real life encounter. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's based on a true story. A lot of it is fictionalized, but at the heart of the story, um, it's based on these true events that happened to a family member of mine who is actually in law enforcement. And uh, this family member of mine had to arrest someone, and the person that he arrested ended up opening up to him about his drug addiction struggles, and uh, they made somewhat of a connection. So I thought that was really beautiful, and I wanted to make a film around that. Now, what about that conversation that stuck with you, that you said, I want to take it a step further? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I just thought it was something that's so unique that you don't really see in films often, mm -hmm. um, especially so, like two people from such different worlds, someone in law enforcement and someone who's struggling with drug addiction um, who just had to be arrested. Um, yeah, I just thought that was two different people, and they came together, and they made an unexpected connection, and I thought that was just really really cool and I wanted to make a film around that. And you did. And then the name Junkie, which you're trying to destigmatize the actual problem, addiction. But with such a name, I feel like it reinforces the presumption, would you say? Yeah, so that's uh, something that, um, you know, it's a little bit controversial and I promise it's not just something to grab people's attention. Um, it's more, I, I put a lot of thought into it and especially in film there's this thing called um, irony being like one of the most important things in the story and um, with this titling it junkie it's ironic at the beginning of the film you're kind of aligned with this idea of seeing these characters as more of just the outside of a junkie um, you don't really see the human behind them and then as the film goes on uh, certain events transpire and um, you know, a devastating event happens, particularly to the, particularly to the main character, and you see him more as the person behind uh, the stigmatized drug problem. This is such a heavy subject, so they needed to be some research behind this to, in order to help you, to help the actors connect to the storyline. Yeah, um, so yeah, with the research, um, so I ended up talking a lot to my family member, about uh, the experiences he had in his job, um, and then connecting with, of course, the real person that the story is based upon. And then um, as far as people struggling with drug addiction, there's a lot of people in my personal life that I ended up talking to and pulling from their stories. I did a lot of online researching about these people and when they felt like they hit rock bottom. Um, and then also I'm working on another project. It's a documentary called The Highway Murders. And um, that's about these women um, back in the 80s, um, uh, people who were addicted to drugs, and many of them were found killed on the highway. Um, but of course, the community that was most impacted by that were people addicted to drugs. So we've done a lot of interviews with those people and looking into their lives and what affects them the most. And I think that really impacted me looking at this as these weren't just people, um, drug addicts being killed, they were people being killed with a drug addiction. So, yeah, it was a lot of looking into people behind the problem and, you know, what um, creates that problem, the, that they feel like they need to rely on drugs. Now, what you just said is what uh, society or education is helping the community to uh, understand that this issue is a disease rather than a life choice. Um, and all of this comes with time and more education. Now, this was your first time, and correct me if I'm wrong, first time directing a film, right? Yeah. So could you talk about your challenges and whether you feel you are able to cement that goal, you're able to reach the conclusion you wanted to reach. Yeah, um, so this was the first legitimate uh, piece that I've done. I've done small things here and there um, with friends, but it's a totally different thing when you're directing real actors and pulling them from New York City all the way over here, and there was just so many challenges every step of the way. Because I wrote the film, I directed it, and I did a lot of producing. It's a 20-minute film, and you know, usually 20 minute films, you'll give like a few weeks to shoot and there's more, it's a more lenient schedule and you have time to work things out, but we had three very strict days. So that was really tough and I was nervous that we weren't going to be able to have the time to really get the emotions right and really craft it. But 
with a lot of preparation we were able to fly right through it was a crazy three days so we were able to get through it and I really do think that we accomplished our goal as a whole team. When you were casting uh, what were you looking for? That's a great question. Um, so when I put out the casting calls, we had about 300 people reply with interest. And that was really overwhelming. What was the caption? What did you say? <laughs> I'm looking for a junkie? <laughs> no, okay. <not. laughs> I basically, so I laid out um, the four main roles. There's, uh, there's four main roles, and they're all men. So I was looking for an older man. Um, kind of put a little blurb about, you know, like a salty cop at the end of his career, and then you know, the younger cop, like the good one, and then, um, of course, the two main characters who are drug addicts. Um, so, yeah, it was just like all these types of people applying and looking to be in the film. And what I was looking for in particular was when they came back with their taped audition um, to just more authenticity. You know, I didn't want any overacting. I didn't want someone who was, like, trying too hard. I just wanted someone who felt like they got it and you could see it in their eyes. Now, you are tapping into a, 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 an issue that is not only pervasive, um, something that has decimated communities for decades, but it's also a, a political issue and also has to do with race. When we're talking about stigma, there are communities that are stigmatized just because of how they look, mm -hmm. right? So, and then their stories are forgotten and people don't look at them as people. Yeah. So yeah. when you were casting and when you were going through with this idea, did you have that in your mind and were you concerned on whether the story that you told was able to encapture everyone's story? Yeah, of course, you know, all different races, all different kinds of people, um, you know, men and women struggle with this. It's really, it's a problem that affects all kinds of people. Um, and especially another one of my family members actually worked in a methadone clinic mm -hmm. for many, many years. And um, that person told me, like, you'd be surprised mm. the kinds of people, um, all different kinds of people. So when I was casting, um, that, was a, that was a huge thing in my mind. You know, I wanted all different kinds of people to be able to relate to it. Um, so yeah, I was just, I was looking for someone who would fit the part, who felt authentic and that we could work forward, um, even refining their performance even more to help all different kinds of people be able to relate to them. And how has it changed your perspective on addiction? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it definitely has changed my perspective even more. Um, I felt like I, I was starting to have an idea based on my family members, um, you know, that they, these people are people. Um, but really just seeing the actors bring it to life and bring their own experiences and, and hearing from them and their experiences um, with drug addiction and how devastating it is, um, yeah, it's really showed me that it's an important issue and we, we should be paying more attention to it, not just brushing it off to the side. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time and you. for answering my questions. Well, to our viewers, the film Junkie is currently on DVD and it is for sale. However, you can get to see it during our summer film festival and we'll have more information for you uh, if you are interested. And uh, if you have further questions, please do not direct them to me, direct them to <laughs> the film herself. So thank you so much for joining us for this interview. I am Queen Band of WCTV. And I wish you all a lovely day. Bye. Well, welcome back. And now we're going to dive into Today in History. So happy Valentine's Day everyone.
I just want to get that out of the way before I read today in history. Because none of these today's facts have to do with Valentine's Day. Well, they have to do. They happen on Valentine's Day, but it has to do with love. I told him to focus on love. Bob says he told him, by him, Noah Wombolt, who prepared this script for me that to focus on love. Well, this is Noah's uh, script here today. We're going to start with, on this day in holy history, the legend of a man who was beheaded in the year 270. Yes, St. Valentine's Day commemorates the Christian priest who was killed in Rome by Emperor Claudius II. The emperor did so uh, when he thought, or because he thought that the Roman men were becoming weak because of the attachments to their wives. So the Emperor, Emperor Claudius banned all marriage in Rome. Oh my goodness. So Valentine thought that this was an injustice. So he continued to perform weddings in secret. When the Emperor finally found out, Claudius uh, was ordered to be killed. The Valentine's Day we celebrate today comes from the old tale, from this old tale, that um, to remind us that we should appreciate the people in our lives. We should show them some love. Oh my goodness, I think this reminds me of the debate. Uh, the Pope is debating or considering, or they want him to consider whether to allow the clergyman to be married. So this reminds me of that, banning the marriage. Anyhow, on this day in crime history, the infamous Valentine's Day massacre occurred in 1929. Gangster Al Capone organized the four of his men to dress as police and break into his rival's headquarters. The gang leader had ordered the hit after a $50,000 bounty was placed on him by his said rival. Uh, Capone's men killed uh, seven of his rival's men, essentially pushing, um, pushing his rival out of the territory. And also today, on this day in Parkland High School shooting, in Park, also today in Parkland, the Parkland High School shooting occurred uh, this day in 2018. A student who had been expelled from school returned with a semi-automatic rifle and shot 34 people, killing 17. Many different protests began, and this is not just in Parkland, but throughout the country, demanding for a uh, reform of the gun law. And many changes have taken place. However, people still feel that more changes should take place. Uh, until today, the murder Nicholas Cruz is still waiting trial. And this concludes this morning history segment. To learn more cool historical facts, you can go online under history.com. Stay with us. The coffee segment is next. But first, let's take a look at our events calendar.
Welcome back. Now, this is the coffee segment with me in the studio is Selectman Alan Slavin. Here to weigh in on multiple topics, one including the debate over naming the new elementary school. We are also going to talk about the Wayhams new campaign that is it is better before the bridges. And also, um, if Wayham, if the, if the Board of Selectmen should consider being political correct. Anyhow, so we're going to start with the most interesting topic, one that the selectmen in this town really wants to hear about, and that is the debate over naming the new elementary school. Um, nothing, there hasn't been any certain uh, news on this. Uh, no decision has been made yet. So far, the citizens petition has been signed and it is going on the April town meeting so people will get the opportunity to vote on a citizen petition to which name they prefer whether it is the proposed name by the school department and the school board that is to call it Wayham Elementary School or the name that was in the original article when we voted to approve funds to appropriate funds to build this school and that was the Dickes School at Minot uh, Forest. Forest Elementary. Okay, so welcome. Afternoon. Good, afternoon. Good morning. As a selectman, but you also have your own personal opinions because of you also get to vote. I'm one vote of, of, of many. Okay. May we start with where you lie on this debate? Which name do you prefer? I prefer the name that was proposed originally, which is the way I voted. When they asked me the question, I said no. Simple. Now this It doesn't matter what I say because, again, I'm only one vote. Mm. This was a citizen's petition, which automatically goes on the warrant, no matter what the selectmen feel. Now, the school committee, you said that you, you preferred the name that was initially proposed, and that is the Dicker School at Manor Forest Elementary. The school board is saying that that was just a placeholder. That was not the intended name. Well, maybe from this side they look at it that way, but officially the way it was submitted to the MSBA, et cetera, that's, what, that's the way it was. But again, you know, the article that came... You know, for the citizens' article was written in such a way that it basically said they were going to take the elementary school and change the name to, you know, the Wareham Elementary School from the Deca School. We have a current Deca School, which is the elementary school. So the article was defective in the way it was written. So during the meeting, I stepped up and I don't think I spoke out of turn, but I basically spoke as an individual saying that this article to me looks like it's defective. And therefore, I gave the, basically the proponents the opportunity to rewrite the article correctly, which has been done. And the new article, which says the new school, to have the name changed to the Wareham Elementary School, is now what's going before town voters, which will have no issue that way. The way it was written was wrong. The way it was written was wrong. Right. Now, the, um, an article on Wareham Week, it did insinuate that the Board of Selectmen did shut down, well, did block the article from entering the... Can't. Okay. It's a citizen's petition. Citizen's petitions uh, are not under the jurisdiction of the Board of Selectmen to put on the warrant or not. They have to go on by law. So, again, the newspaper article was misleading or, cor or incorrect. Okay, so the, now the citizen petition will be in the April um, town meeting warrant so the citizens can vote. Now, so this whole debate to me, and I've heard all these sides, I've talked to um, a member, a family member of the Dickes family, Cindy Parola. Mm -hmm. I've speak, uh, spoken with you before, and I've also spoken with the school department, the superintendent was here. To, so they, they each presented their sides to why they wish one way or the other. So the whole thing to me seems like a misunderstanding between town departments, that is the Wayham uh, School Department, m thinking that the name was a placeholder and the Board of Selectmen feeling that that was the voted name that the town has already decided upon. So I feel that the citizens' petition, it is the correct way to fix this issue. Well, that's what's happening. Okay. That's what's happening. And it was never going to change. Mm -hmm. It just, it would have gone through as an article wrong. And because it's probably a major change, I don't know whether or not the 
moderator would allow the change to be made on the floor. And the change you wanted them to specify that it is a new elementary school they're talking about, not just an elementary school. Correct. Okay. Because if it just went as it is, then it would have to change the current Dicker school to Wareham to Elementary. To Wareham Elementary. And so would be the Minot Forest to Wareham Elementary. Well, there is, well no, yeah. there is no Minot Forest. Absolutely. Okay, so this article is going to go uh, forth. Now, I just, I mean, is this debate worth it? I am a bit baffled by, the, the, by this issue that we're still discussing this topic. Well, we're really not discussing now except the vote. The bottom line is that do you want to keep uh, what we call institutional history? You know, as far as, you know, the names of people, the Minot family, you know, donated the Minot for us. I knew Bill Minot before he passed away. Uh, obviously know the Dicus family and I just personally my own opinion is we should you know keep the names of the people who did things in town I have land and I live I have a house out in Nevada and there's a, that's a lot of buildings out there. there's a lot of new schools every school out there gets named after somebody right on the front of the building to put the name like on a floor and on another floor or whatever is not the same and it's just my own personal opinion though again I'm only one vote so you know I have the right to express my opinion what about the, the opinion um, that the town as a whole are the ones who voted to appropriate these funds to build the new elementary school, therefore it should be an inclusive name? Well, the bottom line is what was applied for is what is, as far as the state's concerned, that's how it was applied. So they have the right to change the name if they want, and the way they did it is to go through you know, as a citizen's petition, because basically the Board of Selectmen would have voted not to change it if it was an article from the school department. So they went through a citizen's petition article. Okay. So it's all moot. What if this is going to save everyone? Nobody's going to look like a bad guy at the end of the day. Um, actually, everybody should be happy because the, it actually went through correctly legally. So there's no recourse or nothing else. Okay. Now, during the meeting, the board of select the President of the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Chairman. The Chairman, thank you, Mr. Patrick Tropiano, um, did say that it was unfair that only 10 people, that is the 10 signatures, in order to pass a citizen petition to go on the town warrant, it was unfair that only 10 people get to make this decision. Again, it's the part of our charter and bylaws, and again, I follow the rules of how it works. Whether you like that system or not, that's the system we have. If it was a special town meeting, it requires 100 signatures. 10 signatures is not a lot, but again, it gives the people the opportunity to put something forth that, yeah, it could go around, you know, what someone wants to do, but that's the way it is. Okay. I, have no, I have no problem. It's, what, it's the rules, and I follow the rules. So he didn't speak on behalf of the board. That was his own personal opinion. A lot of times the selectmen, when they make comments, will speak individually. The only way you would find out it was individual if it, if it was a vote and a poll, and, and that would be out in public. Okay. Did you did the board try to entertain a compromise a, 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 between a, the, the two debates with the school department? No. Maybe. Okay. Have there be open meeting law violations and everything? So the answer is no. I basically kind of stuck my neck out to actually make a comment that the article was defective and should be changed. I did that as an individual. All right. So I'm looking forward to April sound meeting to see what the town is going to decide. Yeah, it'll be interesting because I'm not sure whether or not we're going to have the little electronic voting pieces. I don't know if the moderator has made a decision or not. There was some issue about, you know, the finances of paying for it. And uh, it came up as an issue. And I checked with town council and the community events committee which had agreed to pay for it because it's a community event and, and the, the, the way the article for community events was put together it says community events and then at the bottom it says for tourism or tourists or residents mm -hmm. so residents and town meeting and community event are all linked in so he basically came back and said yeah it would be okay that way but the top, the moderator has to apply to community events committee to ask for the money which has not been done the other choice is that the treasurer, excuse me, the clerk, has money in a particular education, but I, see, I think it's an election budget, because I went and checked all the different accounts everybody had, and there was more than enough money to pay.
but again, it would be up to the moderator to, to, with the treasurer. So as of right now, we may or may not have the electronic voting we had last fall. Okay. But either way, we're going to be voting. Yeah, it's the moderator's call. It's, it's, she runs the town meeting, and it's her call with how, how it functions internally. Okay. All right, so now we're going to move on to another uh, topic. And that is the rebranding campaign, the Wareham rebranding campaign, suggesting that it is better before the bridges. Is it so? Um, I'm not laughing, but it's, again, the way the information gets out there is if Wareham is taking away Gateway to the Cape, you know, we have the two signs that sit in front of the lighthouses by the police station. That is not going away. There's not, there was never any discussion about doing it. The town administrator for the administration basically decided to look at rebranding the town to try and you know Im improve the economy, et cetera. So the director of planning and economic development went out and they hired a company to rebrand the town. Uh, the board of selectmen really had no input per se. Uh, they put out like a little survey of the new logo, et cetera, and that was put out there. It, I think the reaction is really kind of extreme as far as a few people. Overall, we've had, for me anyways, I've had one person complain loudly, one other person said whatever, and other people have said it fine. But what it's done is it's just, it's put a discussion out there, which is what you want to do. But we're not eliminating Gateway to the Cape. Now, before we get to whether, as you said, we're not eliminating Gateway to the Cape, you mentioned that the selectmen did put a poll online for no. people to vote. No, we, we didn't put a poll. We didn't. Again, the town this, did. this is all through the town administration, okay. not through the selectmen. So the town did put a poll, and there were other suggested names, such as Off Cape and On the Rise, um, No Cape Necessary, Miles of Coastline, not, well, Miles of Coastline, slash, I think this is Not Traffic. Yeah, that was another name, Not Traffic. And a destination, Not a Gateway. And then people, by people, the residents of Wareham who went online to suggest which one they liked better, they ended up voting for it is better before the bridges. Yeah. Now, all these names are insinuating that after you cross the bridges, there isn't much to see. It's no. not worth your time. No, what it's saying is that it might be easier and better here than over there. It doesn't say that about the Cape. I have, again, I'm for the Mass Selectors Association, I recommend... I represent Plymouth County, Cape, and the Islands. I've had not one selectman from the Cape call me and say they're not happy with it. Well, you know, the little campaign that they've done. There's been zero. Is it because they feel like it's not worth the argument? Or they're still laughing no, at us? No, because it's not, it's not relevant as far as they're concerned. It's, it's just an advertising campaign to promote it. You could have on the Cape, you've got all the different towns. One town could do the same thing. It's better in, say, Chatham than it is in the rest of the Cape which they do, they all advertise individually as well. Okay. It's just a promotion to try and bring business. When you watch TV every day, you see advertising for Florida, you know, for going over into the Caribbean during the winter time to get away, the Bahamas, it's no different. So we are, this is an advertising slogan for the town of Wareham, but as you mentioned that we are not taking the sign, uh, Gateway to Cape Cod. No, but that's gonna still be, as you come in, you know, we're off the highway and stuff, and as you come in by the police station, the gateway to the Cape, that's there. But how are we going to intertwine or for those two slogans to work together if we are suggesting? Well, you're not. You've got to basically, when you have some, depending how they want to rebrand and how they want to promote, they may have some ads that promote that piece. We've never really promoted and advertised gateway to the Cape. It's just the name that we put there from a long time ago. And we have the Gateman, you know, baseball team. Okay, so it is better before the bridges when we won't see any signs on Main Street? I doubt it. Uh, no, no signs. Well, again, it depends what they, the firm they've hired, what the, the end result is, but as of right now, no. I expect you'll see some kind of promotional stuff saying that. It's that simple. It is that simple. Yeah. And you are uh, insisting that the selectmen had nothing to do with this? No, this was strictly, you know, through the town, through the economic development, you know, portion, you know, planning. And it was just, they put out surveys. They decided to see what they could do to improve the branding of the town, to improve the economy, et cetera, of the town. 
do you feel just changing the slogan that it is better before the bridges is really going to give us or help us economically? It might. If nothing else, it gets the name out there. And, I mean, it was on TV and everything else. And so How long would that news last? Now it's old news. Now it's just the town people complaining. Yeah, so it'll just die out. We'll see what happens. It'll probably pick up again if the town does any kind of advertising, you know, through the, what, the firm that they've hired. It's that simple. It's a, it's a lot of noise about nothing. Okay. We're going to move it's, on. It's, it's wintertime. People are bored. <laughs> no, this, well, yeah, we'll see are. about in the summer. Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, the last topic of the day, and that is whether the select men, the board of select men, should consider going, pol or should consider being political correct. Well, again, I rep, you know, the Mass Selectmen's Association has now changed the name officially at the January annual meeting to the Mass Select Board Association. Uh, there's five representatives that cover the whole state. I can say, I, again, I'm Region 4, which is, you know, basically Plymouth County, Cape, and the Islands. Uh, the Selectmen, and actually a former female Selectman, and also a current one, uh, basically told me there's no way in hell, with their words, we're going to change our name. Uh, Mass General Law, everything in place, says Selectman. It's been there historically. I think that we're going, again, things change, and I think we're going too far over uh, about gender specific, etc. Uh, it was written a certain way. It really, again, I've had no feedback from, you know, the current Selectman as far as any of the female members that they wanted to change the name. Actually, they were vehemently against it. So I brought it before the board, as every town is going to, and there have been a certain number of boards that have changed and others that haven't. So this is kind of a, just depending the way you lean. Now, you are a member of the Massachusetts Selectmen's Association. Yes, It's I now Select Board Association, right? Correct. Could, could you tell, give us some background information to why they decided to be political correct? I think a couple of members of the district members, actually one uh, from the Milton area brought it up, uh, Katie Conlon, and uh, the board decided overall, you know, to go ahead and try it, make the change. Mm -hmm. And it was voted at the annual meeting. Was there any research to back, uh, back up this change, whether it is going to um, inspire more women to get into politics, actually, local politics? I don't really know if that's the case or not. I, I think actually there's been a lot of uh, women in general have come in uh, as select persons, as I call them. It's a gender neutral that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's the case because uh, over the last five years now, I just noticed that the demographics and stuff are changing anyways. Did the, our members, our select men in the town of Wareham, did they specify to why they decided to remain as is? No, I think it was just pretty, pretty straightforward that there was, they weren't going to do it, period. They, you know, it was a unanimous vote twice. twice. I, brought, I brought it up twice. I did my job, and, they, and the answer was, no, we don't want to do it. What did you vote on? Well, I told you the vote was unanimous. <laughs> I, if Mass General Law wants to change, and and the state wants to change, you know, selectmen to select board, then, then we change. If they want to. But if, if they, they do choose, it. They, if they give you the option, then you... Well, it's no option. There's an, op there's an option in the Selectmen's Association if you want to do it. There is no option at the state level as far as how it's written in Mass General Law. Mass General Law says selectmen all through it. it there's no change coming there. As a matter of fact, everything in Mass General Law uh, uses the male terminology for everything. All right. Well, thank you for clarifying some of those um, topics, such as the naming of the new elementary school, and to completely exonerate you yourselves of this mess. Again, you know, people read stuff in the newspapers if they don't see it in person, and they don't get a real, they don't get enough background. You know, what what's behind everything. And what they read a lot of times, this is not accurate. I've been pretty vehement about this for quite a while now. And just recently, we've had a couple of things about traffic, you know, traffic lights. Uh, because I chair the SERPED Commission, which we have evolved in as far as traffic and roads and everything else, 
I was able to get Swiss Beach Road on what they call a TIP, which is a Transportation Improvement Program, which means somewhere down the line there'll be a traffic light installed at Swiss Beach and, you know, Route 6. Uh, recently, the uh, fire chief requested through the uh, John Walchek from the police to c contact me to see if there was a way to get a light at the home at Route 28. And the article that's been written on it says as if it's going to happen. And what's really happened is uh, Mass DOT doesn't consider, because there's so few accidents on the road itself, you know, serious accidents, that it's not a high priority list for them to go ahead and do anything. So the, one of the articles said that the state will pay 80 percent, the town would pay 20 percent. Uh, that's not the case at all right now. As far as that goes, Mass DOT sent me back a letter, you know, after they got the SERPED survey, which said the road could qualify, that it wasn't on their priority list, and that we needed to see if the developers in the area wanted to pay for it, mm -hmm. if there was something on their agreements, you know, for their development that when traffic hit a certain level, they would put a light in, you know, or, um, you know, the town would want to pay for it. So therefore, it's as if, well, we're going to get a traffic light, and we're going to get a traffic light at Swiss Beach Road. Well, it's not going to happen right away. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Again, because nobody really looks deep enough into the actual information given out. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for coming to the studio to clarify this information, and we hope you will come back again. Um, I just read a brief article on Wareham Week, that is the budget is... Um, not voted on, but we have uh, an understanding to what it will be, what kind of budget we're going to be voting yeah, for. Yeah, I mean, we continue, to, the budget keeps increasing, you know, because we're allowed a certain amount of increases every year. But we're still, we're maintaining, we're doing better than maintaining. Uh, there was an article uh, from the Department of Revenue, uh, the DESI, which is an organization for the schools, shows Wareham is 24% over minimum funding, which everybody always says we're at you know, at the minimum, we're not, we're, we're actually good. We really got, uh, we got very little money out of the new proposed student opportunity plan. Everybody thought there'd be a lot of money coming. We didn't do well, as did 170 other communities, did not do well. Milton, which is a very wealthy community, got over a million dollars extra. So there's something really wrong. Okay, so we'll bring you back in the studio to talk and to complain about the wealthy communities getting wealthier every single day. Basically. Well, hopefully with the new slogan, it's better before the bridges, we will be recognized and we'll get more money. We don't know. We'll see. It's, <laughs> everything's worth a try. Well, that was Selectman Alan Slavin in the studio to talk about three major topics today. The name debate over naming the new elementary school, the new Wayham slogan that it is better before the bridges, and whether Selectman should consider being political correct, in which they all voted a no. Anyhow, this concludes this morning's show. If you missed us, this particular show will be aired this evening at 6 p.m. We'll also be back here on, actually, Friday, because Monday it is President's Day. And, yes, Bob is like, what is going on? We'll be back here on Friday. Thank you so much, and have a pleasant day.